Hi, Linda. Hello. Uh, I'm Sarah Posner with Religion Dispatches, and I'm here today with Linda Sarsour, who is the National Advocacy Director for the National Network of Arab American Communities, as well as the Executive Director of the Arab American Association of New York. Um, Linda is um, a well-known advocate uh, uh, in the community in New York and nationally, and she was named last year as a champion of change um, by the White House. Uh, and Linda, I understand that today, as we're taping, you just finished debating uh, Pamela Geller on a BBC program about the New York City subway ads that are going to start going up next week. Um, for people who don't know Geller, um, uh, is an anti-Muslim activist whose American Freedom Defense Initiative filed suit against the uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority in New York to be able to put up posters that read, um, in any war between the civilized man and the savage, support Israel, defeat Jihad. So how did that debate go? Um, I thought that de it debate went really well for me anyway, um, and it, uh, funny enough, I turned out to be the civilized one in that uh, discussion <laughs> against Pamela Geller, which probably defeated the purpose of what she was trying to portray uh, on that show. Um, so what is her defense of, now obviously, uh, I'm, just to full disclosure, I am a First Amendment absolutist sort of person, mm -hmm. um, but you know, just on a, not on a First Amendment grounds, but just on just sort of basic, you know, is this necessary or uh, appropriate grounds, how does she defend the content of these posters that she wants to put up? I mean, I'm also a First Amendment um, absolutist myself, and I, uh, I actually uh, support freedom of speech and her First Amendment right to put up these uh, these ads, I mean, b but I also support the response that she's going to get. So she's creating a d discourse and a debate, and she got to be prepared to take the heat um, on what she's portraying on these ads. I mean, she basically uh, is uh, trying to give me all these examples of, you know, all these terrorists and terrorist attacks and talking and trying to bring in the recent protest around the anti-Muslim film and mm -hmm. giving me all these examples. And I, you know, and my thing to her was, that she says this was in response to some ads that were put up in the MTA around uh, asking the United States government to end military aid to Israel. And I said to her, there's nothing wrong with those ads because they did ne they never portrayed Jews or Israelis as savages. This is a political, it was a merely political um, campaign to end um, the U.S. aid to a military occupation uh, of Palestine, which many people across the world uh, don't agree with. Um, and we've had and, plenty and, of presidents in our history. Who put who put those ads up? It were that those ads were put up by the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. Um, a, a group of predominantly non-Arabs and non-Muslims in the United States who are against mm -hmm. the Israeli occupation of Palestine. And mm -hmm. she goes further to say Palestine. There is no Palestine. I mean, once once she started on that kind of conversation line, it, for me, it, it was almost I, I didn't even feel like I was talking to another American. I mean, to 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 not, to not recognize that there is a Palestinian people. She pretty much did not recognize my presence on that show with her as a Palestinian. American, um, and she also um, it talks about the uh, the uncivilized, uh, you know, that there's a civilized people and that there's the savages, and she's promoting hate under the banner of freedom of speech um, in an uncivilized manner. She's creating, uh, you know, a discourse um, that is uncivilized. And there's other ways that she can bring up a uh, debate on Islam. I mean, we welcome criticism of Islam, but you can do it in a more civilized manner. She is not a civil woman, and she has. I mean, Andre, Andre Brevik, the, the, the Norwegian terrorist. I mm -hmm. mean, this guy was citing people like Geller and Emerson. I mean, I mean, she has to understand that with freedom of speech comes responsibility, that she has to uh, understand that sometimes words are very powerful and people, uh, if people are, are quoting you um, and then going out and, um, and killing people, you might want to think about what you're putting out before you put it out and what it exactly is inciting or what exactly are you trying to convey. So Geller has a history not just uh, uh, as an anti-Muslim activist, but specifically in New York City. She was one of the people who led the charge against the so-called Ground Zero Mosque. 
um, or otherwise known as the Cordoba House. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think, I mean, do you think that the Muslim community in New York uh, knows that Geller is behind these signs that are going to go up in the subway? And what do you think the reaction is going to be once the signs start going up? I mean, this is not the first time that Pamela Geller has ever put up ads in New York City, just an FYI. She's, she had a mm -hmm. campaign about a year and a half or two years ago where she had this campaign um, uh, asking, basically the campaign uh, messaging was like, if you want to leave Islam, call us because we're going to protect you. Um, uh, saying that anyone who right, I had forgotten about that actually. Yeah, mm -hmm. so she's so this woman has a a, a, a record of uh, of these um, offensive ads, and um, I wouldn't worry I wouldn't worry too much about anyone in New York City uh, having any violent protest. And one of the you know one of the things that we tell our people is don't give these people or elevate their profile even more. The more you attack people like Geller, the more that you give them. She, what she wants is the spotlight. Um, obviously, this ad got her a spotlight. She got on BBC, and I'm sure she'll be on many news uh, cast and, 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 and on many uh, commentaries. But, I mean, she's irrelevant. She's, she's not the majority of the, of the United States people, of the American people, and she's making money off of this. That's the unfortunate thing. Freedom of speech, when people are making money off of it, that's where I also have um, a, 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 an issue with her message. She's making money off of being anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, um, anti-Palestinian. Like this lady, this is what she does for a living. Like this is not like something that she does on the side where I have a political opinion. Like I have a full-time job and then I have a political opinion about something. So it's unfortunate that people in this country are making money off of hate. Now, is there any evidence that this was uh, timed in any particular way, her, her poster campaign, or is it just that she just, the lawsuit just was resolved, and so that's, that explains the timing about the, the I mean, I, I try not being, I try not to be a conspiracy theorist, but um, I feel like it's just such a coincidence that you have the, you have this amateur hateful film then you have these about the innocence of Muslims, the innocence film of that, Muslims mm -hmm. film that sparked, you know, outrage across the world. And then you have the French yesterday, the, um, the a French magazine also uh, printed uh, very blasphemic, um, you know, cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. And then you have Monday, the start of these uh, subway ads uh, in New York City. I, I just feel like it, it, it might have not been the right time, um, and I think that we need to be conscious of what type of message are we also sending across the world. And yes, while I'm defending you know, the, the freedom of speech and the First Amendment, I think, again, it comes with some responsibility. Um, well, let's switch gears for a minute and talk about this hearing that you came to Washington for yesterday. Um, it was held by a subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and um, it was, I'm forgetting the precise title, but it was about addressing domestic extremism. And it hate seemed crime. to be yeah. hate, hate crime, crime right. and the, the threat of domestic extremism was the title of the hearing. Okay, and, and it seemed to be in the immediate term, per perhaps prompted by the terrible shooting at the Sikh temple in Wisconsin. Yes. Um, but that is that right? Was that a factor in in prompting the subcommittee to have the hearing? Um, I know that obviously that was not the only sort of hate crime that was addressed there. I mean, always um, when national tragedies happen, they do uh, they become the the impetus of, of of these hearings or this type of kind of creating this discourse, but it, it definitely wasn't the only sole focus of the hearing, but I will say that it definitely was a driver in making sure that this hearing happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what, I, you know, I, I was only able to watch little snippets of it uh, online, so I, I, I didn't see the whole thing. What was, what were some of the things that they addressed at the hearing or what were some of the uh, pieces of information or facts that they were able to bring to light there? Well, there are two panels. The first panel was a government panel. Um, most of the government representatives were from the Department of Justice, just kind of talking about hate crimes in general, talking about hate groups in general, and kind of what, what the actual threat of domestic extremism is. Um, then they were talking about the reporting around hate crimes in this country. Uh, and then the second panel included... Um, obviously a testimony from one of the so a son of one of the women who was killed in Oak Creek which was a very touching testimony 
about a young man who just started college who could be anyone's son, anyone's brother, and just kind of talking about how the impact of the shooting was on his person, on him personally, on his per on his family, but also on his community in Oak Creek as well as nationally. Um, and he said uh, said he asked, he requested something of the government that I saw that I thought was so profound and will probably stay with me forever. He said to he said I ask of you today to give my mother the dignity of being a statistic. Usually the rhetoric is we don't want people just to be statistics, but the fact that Sikh, Arab, and South Asian Muslim Americans, when in hate crime, there there is, isn't a clear category for people to even um, be categorized when it comes to hate crimes. It, uh, if for this young man, it said he wanted his mother to be counted, to that Sikh Americans, when filing on hate crimes don't have a category, so we can't even understand the impact of hate crimes on the community because we don't even have the numbers that go along with it. And then we had a former analyst uh, that used to work for the government um, that was, uh, his focus was on uh, domestic uh, hate groups and militias. Um, and basically his point was that if you look at where the uh, U.S. government is focusing their funds now, that he went from a team of multiple analysts looking at this to probably only one or two in the entire federal government that really has a focus specifically on the area of domestic extremism and hate groups. And then there, were, uh, there was a Republican witness um, who was a professor at NYU, and this guy basically, his whole point was, I don't really think we should have hate crimes legislation. If there's a crime of murder, assault, vandalism, that we already have the criminal prosecutions, that there's no need to add an extra layer uh, uh, of you know, classifying it as a hate crime. And while, you know, punitively speaking, you know, when it comes to the way we prosecute, that makes sense. I get what I get what his point is about that. But on the public sphere, we need to make sure that people understand that we will not tolerate hate motivated crimes against people in this country. So it sends a public message um, that we will not tolerate this. But he thought that from a you know law perspective that it doesn't really do much and it, it's not really necessary. So that was the Republican um, witness uh, there, but the most touching piece of it was this testimony from a regular kid who, yeah. uh, you know, just it really touching. I mean, everybody was crying in there. It was really, um, but also uh, we had a press conference after the uh, hearing, and um, you know, the point that I made was is that we're in an election season right now, and our communities, Arab, South Asian, Muslims, we are going to vote for leadership that stands up against hate. We're gonna we're gonna vote for leadership that doesn't believe that. The unwarranted surveillance of entire faith um, communities um, is okay, so so that people don't think that you know that our community we have some principles that we will stand by, and these are some of the principles that we are going to be uh, using to drive our votes in uh, elections. So, what was your sense from the hearing about? Uh, do you think that you know? Because it's interesting if you juxtapose this against the the NYPD spying on Muslims scandal that mm -hmm. I'm sure you're very familiar with. Uh, you know, so here you had the NYPD just basically profiling Muslims in New York City. You know, if you went to eat at a Lebanese restaurant, you were subject to being spied on just because you went to eat at a Lebanese restaurant or you went and had coffee with your friends at a um, Middle Eastern cafe or what have you. Um, and it recently came out that they found no, they got no leads or no terrorism, not even leads, tips or anything, much less a prosecution out of this entire program. And did you get the sense from the hearing that law enforcement is taking seriously the you know, actual domestic terrorism that takes place uh, as um, something that they need to be focusing on and trying to prevent, you know, terrorist, terrorist acts perpetrated by people who aren't Muslims, but are something else, as was the case with the perpetrator in the Oak, um, the Oak Creek shooting. My personal opinion is that I absolutely do not believe that the U.S. government is doing enough to combat domestic extremism, that we've had a fixation and an obsession with uh, the radicalization and the extremism within the Muslim American community that we're actually um, putting the rest of the American people, uh, uh, we're putting the rest of the American people uh, in danger. And uh, one of the examples, a couple of examples that I can, can give you while we're focusing on, um, you know, uh, Muslim American extremists or Muslim extremists in the U.S. 
We missed out on Michael Page, the guy who went into a Sikh temple and, and massacred six people, including a police officer, uh, because he thought they were Muslims. Um, mm -hmm. we are, right. We're also missing out on these five anarchists that were arrested in Ohio that had, you know, uh, explosives and other potential dangerous material. Um, and even the way the media portrays um, these different uh, uh, attacks, I'm, I, I was really, uh, you know, when, I, when they called the the, the uh, Sikh shooting a d case of domestic uh, terrorism, I was like, wow, like, why shouldn't we be surprised? I mean, this is something that should be the first thing that we think of when we when we have these things happen on, on our soil. But the other interesting point is that the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a group that kind of monitors hate groups, and also the Anti-Defamation League, they've already been monitoring, 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 excuse me, monitoring people like Paige, right? And Paige specifically, which is the the shooter in this um, in the in the Sikh temple. So they've been watching him over the years. The fact that public interest groups had more information on Paige than the FBI. I would be pretty concerned um, about how our government is dealing with cases of domestic extremism. I mean, look at uh, Congressman Gifford shooter. I mean, this guy had a manifesto, uh, an anti-government manifesto, and he went specifically targeting a public official. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if that's not concerning to people, I, I really don't know what is. So how do you think, so this, this, with the innocence of Muslims video, how you know we see how it pl has played in other parts of the world where there have been, relative to the entire population of Muslims around the world, a very small number of people protesting, mm -hmm. um, and some protesting peacefully against this film, and some obviously there's been violence too. Although mm -hmm. I guess in Libya it's a little unclear what the immediate. Um, uh, precipitating uh, provocation was with the uh, assassination of the uh, American ambassador and, and mm -hmm. other consular employees. But um, what is your sense of how Americans are watching what is happening around the world? I mean, do you get, the, I mean, because if you look at the media coverage, I, I, I worry about the media coverage making it seem more that there are more Muslims protesting against the film than there are. And it, that serving as some sort of representation of the Muslim world, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to, you know, there might be Muslims who are offended by it, but they're, you know, just continuing to go about their lives without doing anything about it because they realize that it's just, some idiot who made this ridiculous film. Mm -hmm. But what's your sense of the coverage here and how Americans are perceiving it? So I will, I'm, I'm going to just start out by saying that I condemn any type of um, violence um, against innocent people, regardless of um, from what, which side it's coming from. But I think that uh, two things, uh, two points. The first one is I think that our uh, media coverage is very, very schizophrenic. It's kind of almost bipolar. We focused our media coverage on the calls of Arabs across the Arab world peacefully de demonstrating um, for, for democracy and freedom uh, in the Arab Spring. We, we, were, we spent a majority of our time as Americans virtually in Tahrir Square with the Egyptian people. Um, and so inspired by the calls of freedom across you know, Yemen and Syria. And then we go a year later, a year and a half later, and now all of a sudden uh, the media coverage is about these, you know, outrage, you know, angry Muslims burning down embassies, you know, across the Arab world. And, 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 and it's very interesting how the media, you know, is so inconsistent. Let's say there are 50,000, 100,000 Muslims across the Arab world that are protesting. We're talking about uh, one, you know, one one hundredth percent, or not even, of 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 a of a, of a faith community that is one point six billion people. So one hundredth of a percent of one point six billion people um, across uh, the world that are protesting. And we also have to look at a broader picture, right? So the, the it's not just about the film; it's this anti-American sentiment that's across the world, and we need to ask ourselves why is that. And what concerns me is that media pundits and some of the more influential and people that I actually thought were really reasonable, like people like Scarsborough, were like, 
why do they hate us? They hate us because of their religion and because of their culture. You're talking First, about Joe Scarborough and MSNBC? Yes, Joe Scarborough mm-hmm. and MSNBC. And, you know, he's one of the reasonable ones. Like, all right, mm-hmm. I don't I always agree with him, but he's pretty reasonable, I would say. Mm-hmm. I mean, until recently. And he says, why do they hate us? And there's, like, a, people can look this up on YouTube. And he says, you know, they hate us because of their religion. They hate us because of their culture. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, we got this guy who people probably think is a really intelligent guy. Muslims, we do not all share the same culture. Palestinian Muslims are not the same or don't have the same culture as Malaysian right. Muslims or Indonesians or Pakistanis or Afghanis. So, like, the fact that he lumped us all into this one culture, that we all share the same culture, we all hate America. Now, we also have to say to ourselves, do people hate America? They, there's plenty that do. There's plenty in America that hate America. I mean, the fact that we just recently, in this past week, there was a, uh, they, uh, we, uh, we, we basically bombed and killed eight a women and girls, you know what I mean? Like, we still have a war going on in Afghanistan. We have drones. We have, um, you know, uh, you know, this unequivocal support for um, Israel. Um, we have a presidential, uh, a, the DNC platform was changed last minute in front of the entire world where we say Jerusalem is the capital um, of Israel. And then we keep talking about this peace process. I mean, people have to understand that we are a leading example in the world. People watch us. What we say it matters. Our words as a country and what we reflect to the other side of the world is important. Um, so we need to understand the pressures that these people have. Yeah, it's one film and they go out and protest and they should not be uh, engaging in any violence. Obviously, we should, the, the last people we should be uh, hurting are ambassadors, people who are trying to create peace in our countries. But... You know, it's not an isolated incident. I mean, we really need to think about the broader foreign policy um, and the rhetoric that's coming out of the United States government, particularly now in the elections with the two candidates. Um, it, it's really disturbing. And I, I mean, I'd be angry, too. Uh, but I think people are not looking at it in that way. So well, what's some of the rhetoric that you think is uh, troubling or problematic coming out of the presidential campaigns? Well, obviously, I guess the... Um, the newly released secret video of Mitt Romney at the uh, at the uh, fundraiser in Florida, where I'm trying to remember exactly how he phrased it. That all, all essentially he was saying that no Palestinians want the Palestinians, broadly speaking, all of them lumped together, don't want peace and don't want a two state solution. Is that that's one of the things that you were thinking of? Yeah, so I mean, basically, Mitt Romney, who's probably never met with Palestinians ever in his life, um, basically says, no, it's the Palestinians' fault. They don't want peace because, of course, Palestinians, we enjoy military occupation. We enjoy checkpoints. Uh, we enjoy, you know, we enjoy the situation that we're in right now. And, and I'm thinking to myself, like, really, that makes so much sense. Um, I think the the Arab, you know, Arab Americans, Arabs in diaspora, the Palestinians, I mean, we're not looking for anything to change, whether from the Obama administration or even from the uh, the Romney, if there ever were to be a Romney administration. Uh, this is not the first time Romney has said, um, you know, anti kind of Palestinian. I mean, a couple of months ago, he said something around where the Palestinian culture that he's been to the that part of the world and Palestinian right. culture is inferior. Like, what are you talking about? I mean, one of the most richest cultures um, in the world and he's telling us that the reason why we're in the situation we're in is because we have an inferior culture. I mean, we've also heard people like Newt Gingrich say that the Palestinian people are an invented, invented people. people. Right. I mean, I mean, the rhetoric continues and the Palestinian people have been used way too long as a wedge point issue in these elections. We're tired of it. Then um, the debates are coming up. You'll hear the radical Islamists and the you know uh, and making up words um, and this this focus again this fixation on extremism and terrorism coming from only one sect of the world. It, it's going to get ugly. Um, and the other thing also that's really interesting is that you know you had President Obama go to Cairo and there's this big speech to the world. You know, uh, from he was really strategic. You know about choosing Cairo and then he chose Al Arabiya as one of his first international interviews. And the guy's never been to a mosque, for God's sakes. You're in the United States of America. It, m- Islam is the is the is is one of the thir- three world religions. The one of the fastest growing religions in the world. 1.6 billion people um, identify themselves as Muslims in the world, and our own president has not been to a mosque. Even President well, Bush. Well, I mean, <laughs> you gotta figure that the reason for that is um, he. Politically speaking, I imagine that they're nervous about the false assertions that 
he's a Muslim or secret Muslim or secretly in bed with terrorists and that whole conspiracy theory about who Obama is and he's not a real American and he wasn't born in the United States and he doesn't have a real birth certificate and he's a mm-hmm. Muslim on top of that and all of those things are connected together and while he ha you know, like you say, he hasn't been to a mosque. I'm not I actually I'm trying to think if he's I mean he's re- very rarely actually gone to church, but he has done a lot of stuff at the White House, um, which raises another, you know, other other political questions about whether, you know, whether it's a good idea to host a Seder and host an Iftar and, and do various um, things with religious groups in the White House. But, you know, whatever. I mean, he's been pretty even handed about it in terms of he doesn't appear to be favoring one religion and hosting mm-hmm. this particular kind of religious event at the White House. But I imagine that, I mean, if he went to a mosque in the United States, that it would, well, on the one hand, you know, he would obviously obviously be politically speaking to one uh, constituency, you know, people who are tolerant and don't care, and <laughs> American Muslims. I think that the way that it would be used by his political adversaries would be horrible and vicious and ugly. I mean, don't you? I, I mean, I mean, yes and no. I mean, what I yeah. what I hope that the Obama administration and particularly his campaign would realize is that those people who are attacking President Obama and saying he's Muslim are never going to vote for him, whether he goes oh, to well, the Oh, absolutely. Or he right. Yeah. I don't, I don't so, think that they hold out hope that those people will vote for them. Yeah, yeah. I just think that there's a crowd. They're trying to I mean, avoid, trying to avoid what, um, I'm trying to think of what I might call it a shit storm that they didn't need to have, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, something that would be a distraction, and yeah. I mean, I I hear what you're saying, but I. I mean, you have Republican. You you had a Republican, a very prominent Republican in this country, like Colin Powell, um, around the 2008 elections. You know, before obviously President Obama was elected, and he said, you Mm -hmm. know, what if President Obama was a Muslim? You know, like who cares? Like, does does it matter? What if he was? And that's what the and that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for President Obama to you know we don't need to we don't need him to do anything special for us. Or we're not you know and, and, and kind of align himself in a way that's you know overtly like pro this community. I mean we're not really looking for that, but we are looking right. for someone to say, and what and so what if I was a Muslim? And I mean I don't want President Obama to say that, but we need leadership on both in both parties. And we did find that from Colin Powell, where we're like, where we're like, listen, Muslim Americans have been here since the slave trade. Like, we are, right. we do not have to keep fighting in this country for people to recognize us as Americans. Like Pamela Geller, for example, today is telling me there is no Palestine, and right. I'm here as a Palestinian American, born and raised in Brooklyn, and I have a woman in my country who, many people, there are people that are like Pamela Geller. Pamela Geller is not just one, is not just Pamela Geller. There's people that think like her who are members of her organization. There are other organizations like hers. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, like when, when are people just going to realize that people like me are American? And when you ask me for my opinion, my opinion is not that of a Muslim or a Palestinian. I'm right. just another American opinion. Um, and there are people that are going to agree, you know, we're going to disagree. There are going to be other people that are non-Arab and non-Muslim that are going to agree with me. But we're being attacked consistently on multiple levels, whether it's from the media, whether it's from elected officials, and not just on the, pre- on the, on the federal level. I mean, look at, you know, Congressman Peter King from New York. I mean, the rhetoric that comes out of this guy's mouth, I mean, the, the fixation he has on extremism in Muslim Americans, he's held over five hearings. He's even held a hearing that was, not only was he holding hearings on the radicalization of Muslim Americans, he was holding hearings on the response of the Muslim community on his hearings, right. wasting our resources. And when our Congress is blocking jobs expansion, when our Congress is blocking immigration and opportunities for undocumented students, when our Congress wants to take away our health care, you know, health care reform and health care access. I mean, these are the things that we also care about, too. People think we don't care about that. We care about domestic issues. Like, I don't wake up every morning saying I'm only going to worry about foreign policy today. I care about better education for my kids. Right. So, like, these are these are the other things about how we're perceived as a community that we're not loyal, that our interests only lie across the world. When I'm born and raised here, I care about my neighborhood. I care about the schools. I want my kids to go to the best schools. I want my kids to have the best college education. I want to make sure I have the best quality care when, you know, when it comes to health uh, health care. And people talk to us like we only care about civil rights and we only care about Palestine and what's happening in Pakistan. Yes, I do care about that, but I also care right. about local issues. Well, <clears throat> What I thought was sort of interesting and revealing about uh, the new 
Pam Geller Mm -hmm. poster was, I think that within this community of agitators who um, try to portray Islam as this monolithic, terroristic, um, basically not a religion, but a political agenda that's violent and anti-democratic, which is like essentially what, what Geller is about. Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of them try to say, well, I'm not talking about Islam as a whole. I'm talking about radical Muslims or radical this or, or um, uh, Islamofascists is a term that they use, but they don't really try very hard to define what that is. And so the rhetoric has a tendency to bubble over and just seem like it really is referring to almost all Muslims. Um, but she was very, I mean, this poster is not even t- making any kind of effort at that. I mean, to use the word savage, I mean, in, in con- contraposed against civilized, civilized mm-hmm. man and the savage. I mean, it's like so, I, I just wonder, is she going too far with it? Is it just t- so ridiculous that people will tune it out i mean it's so intentional like like it's not you know there's a difference between her saying you know defend israel support israel like go to this website which would have been you know fine i mean if you want to support israel support israel i mean that's 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 the the right of every american and but for her to call to make a distinction between the two parties involved when it comes to to our our foreign policy on palestine israel to say this is, there's a civilized and there are savages. I mean, savages is another word of saying animals, like people that have people barbarians, who are barbarian, right. barbaric, like barbarian people who are like uneducated, like prime, almost like primates. You know what I mean? So like, there has to be an intention of hers there. She's not just doing this because she wants, because she's pro-Israel. I don't think she really gives a crap about Israel. I just think that she's a very provocative woman, and I'm almost believing inside of me that she wants to see if there's a big, if there's some sort of violent response or some like outrageous response for her to sit back and say, see, I told you guys, these people don't like, you know, they don't support freedom of speech. Look at these savages and how they're responding to my, to my ads. And we're not going to give her what she wants. And that is what she wants. And she, uh, people like her and pastor Terry Jones, and he's going back to Michigan in the next couple of weeks. Um, right. And he just, well, you know, Provocative. He wants to be able to just sit back and say, "See, I'm just uh, asserting my freedom of speech, and these crazies are protesting me. They, they were, th- you know, they threw a bottle at, you know, whatever things that he wants to use to say well, that I, I do these think people that are savages. These most provocative uh, efforts, like burning the Quran or um, the uh, Innocence of Muslims film, or film like." whatever or obsession calling it a film isn't really um accurate but uh that it's intended to see this proves our point right our point Mm -hmm. is that they are violent and can't be controlled and all i did was this one little thing and look you know Mm -hmm. but then again it's the extrapolating that there's you know very like you said one one hundredth of a percent of Muslims worldwide might have engaged in this sort of thing Mm -hmm. and it doesn't it doesn't prove his point you know it proves what you and I and reasonable people know that in every community there are people who can be provoked to um, extreme reactions or even violence um, and that's not limited to Muslims. Absolutely. And she even said I quoted her uh, today when I was um, we were debating on BBC World News and she she said you know, you tell me when is it the right time to blaspheme? Like she, she, that's what she wants to do. She wants to blaspheme. She, she, she even uses that rhetoric, which is what's so concerning that she exa- understands exactly what she's doing. And what she's doing is blaspheming one of the world's largest religions and it, with the intention of promoting hate and potentially inciting a community or individuals within a community to respond to her in a way that reaffirms the message she's trying to send out, which is that, see, I told you these people are savages. And the media plays into it. I mean, you saw the cover of Newsweek. You have always like, bring angry, that up, right? Yeah, right. like these all these angry Muslim-looking guys with these their mouths all wide open, um, which are again so, such a small fraction of the people that were doing prayer vigils in front of the consulates across the world, where people were holding up signs saying, you know, we are Chris Stevens, we are, apologize. Like those were the, the 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 images you saw. You just were you people were just seeing, you know, people saying Allahu Akbar with like a whole bunch of fire flames behind them. And it was it was it was disgusting. 
So you're referring to the, the Newsweek cover with the article written by Ian Hersi Ali. Um, and I think the, the words on the cover were Muslim rage. Yep, that's the one. Um, so, but that spawned a reaction on Twitter. Well, I think Newsweek, in fact, on Twitter, invited people to engage in conversation about yeah, it. Yeah, they started it, that. They, start, they were the ones that started that hashtag, which was the first Right, the one. hashtag Muslim rage. But I think there were a lot of people on Twitter who turned it into a kind of, you know, comical pushback satire, against, yes, um, against Newsweek. Can you, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the examples of the ones that were, I mean, they, people intended to make them comical um, in a way that, you know, so it's yeah, like an I mean, ordinary thing that happens to you and you get, you know, you get a hangnail and Muslim rage. Yeah, like, well, like that, sort, saying, that sort of level. It was, it was actually pretty amusing, but also I thought not just amusing, but really effective. I'm, Absolutely. I wish I had I printed out some of the yeah. some of the. I remember. I remember examples. some of them. I remember some of them because I engaged um, in in that uh, Twitter uh, hashtag. I mean, the other thing about the social media network is what's wonderful about it is that it's really about um, the c contributions of ordinary people into a larger conversation. And when Newsweek put out the, it was there. People thought we made up that hashtag. It wasn't us. It was it was the Newsweek hashtag. And it started a little bit negative in the beginning, but then when an overwhelming majority of Muslims and non-Muslims engaged in the hashtag, I mean, first of all, it was hilarious. It was things like, you know, I'm having a good hair, you know, a, a young woman who's like, you know, in a hijab on Twitter is like, I'm having a good hair day, but you can't see it, Muslim rage, or, <laughs> right. or right. I just realized that the turkey sandwich I just ate wasn't halal, Muslim rage, you know, just really right, using right. very simple, you know, kind of comical little things that uh, are very, you know, non-controversial, uh, talking about, you know, like someone said, Dupe Fiasco got married, Muslim rage, you know, um, you know, like things like using examples. Or somebody said when you are, you know, doing wudu, which is a ablution before prayer in a public bathroom, and then you get caught the minute you're about to put your foot into the sink, and someone walks into a public bathroom, and then someone says Muslim rage. I mean, these are like real life things that happen to people, and it was really, it was really, um, it really shows another side of the Muslim community. I mean, we are normal people with wonderful senses of humor, and we did this before after the um, the NYPD uh, kind of report, uh, the AP re investigative report on the mm -hmm. unwarranted surveillance of Muslims. We started a hashtag called my NYPD file on, you know, making, 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 uh, you know, jest of the NYPD and all these files that they have on individuals and what would people, what would people find? And what boring file. life most people have. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I study for 16 hours a day and sleep for four my, in right. my NYPD file or, you know, I like, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm an obsessed shopper and I like H and M and, you know, whatever, you know, and, and just people like really, it was hit one of the most hilarious and really therapeutic for Muslims. I'll be honest with you. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, this is hard work we're dealing with here. And, you know, these civil rights violations were being demoralized as an entire community. Our faith is being blasphemed. I mean, our, our, we're worrying about our loved ones in places like Syria, um, in Afghanistan. We're seeing a lot of turmoil in Pakistan and other places. And we have families over there. So within amidst all of this, like pressures that these pe people are dealing with to have an opportunity to laugh, you know, or to have some, you know, you know, like, you know, sometimes you have to laugh, you have to bring right. in a sense of humor. Or you have to bring some levity to it. But, yeah. So do you think that, I mean, beyond that purpose uh, mm -hmm. served by the social networking around these issues, do you think that it has an impact on other people? I mean, obviously, like on Twitter, you know, you follow who you want to follow. And so you do mm -hmm. sort of create your own insular world. So maybe if somebody didn't, necessarily want to plug into that thing or even aware that there is like this mm -hmm. meme happening on Twitter. You could be on Twitter and be completely unaware of it, but do you feel mm -hmm. like it is penetrating people's consciousness at all? I mean, because obviously like all it would take is a retweet or two for somebody to see a handful of those tweets, if not all mm -hmm. of them or a huge chunk of them. And do you feel like it, that, is potentially having a, a positive impact on the way people are seeing seeing the issues and also seeing Muslim Americans. I definitely believe that it, it penetrates into other kind of circles that maybe we're not in. Like for example, when I when I open Twitter, sometimes I look at you know U.S. trends and what's trending, and then if there's something that really catches my eye, I click on it to see what it is. And you know, yesterday during the Senate hearing on hate crimes and domestic extremism, we trended anti-hate. 
Um, it was trending. Um, it, it was trending in the U.S. And mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody was like anti-hate, and they clicked on it. And I'm sure that they were able to, to 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 at least engage or at least read some of the tweets. And I did see random people I didn't know um, mm -hmm. tweeting, uh, you know, that were non-Arabs and non-Muslims. And then on the Muslim rage, there definitely that was trending. I think that trended worldwide. And uh, I'm sure people were like, "Muslim rage, wow, this looks really spicy. Let me go check it out." Um, <laughs> and I do that. And I do that all the time when I see things that catch my eye. You know, right. and sometimes it's not even related to the. US and I read their tweets and I actually one of the things I learned about um, like Twitter for example is that if there's another hashtag that's trending and it's not my hashtag is not trending or something that I'm engaged in I use a trending hashtag that says like some you know four words that describe me and then um, and then I put in a different point with my hashtag and then you can start almost you know you get the attention of those people and then you ask a couple of other people to do that as well. There's different really creative ways of getting into other circles. And then after a couple of incidents locally, like the Aurora shooting, you know, I started tweeting around gun laws and, and how do we mm -hmm. strengthen gun laws in this country. And I have a lot of different kind of people that follow me. If you look at my followers, I actually have a lot of like quote unquote patriots, people whose like whole thing is like American flag, they're veterans, you know, and when I, what I found on Twitter is I do have a lot of trolls, people who tell me that I'm like, you know, you know, the prophet's prostitute and like really outrageous things that I can't believe people would say. That but I do have funny. other people who I've engaged in, um, in, in civil discourse. Like I've, I've gotten into a civil, and I'm like, okay, why do you civil think Civil discourse that? on Twitter? What? Yes, I have civil discourse <laughs> with people on Twitter. People who would start out by saying, you know, all Muslims are terrorists. And I say wow, like, why do you think that? And then instead of me saying, no, oh, you're the terrorist, you know, whatever. And then when somebody gets an opportunity where someone asks them, why do they think that? And then they get into a conversation with me on Twitter. And obviously all of my conversations are there and, you know, people look at my mentions. I mean, I've had civil discussions um, with people on Palestine and Israel and what's happening. Um, and, and once you engage people in civil, most people will actually engage you. They, they just think that you're about to attack them. I don't need to attack you. You have an opinion and I want to know where that opinion came from. And if there's an opportunity for you to, for me to change your opinion, then why not? There's this random guy on Twitter. His name is Wally. He, he's been following me for the past eight months wonderful discourse between me and him about different topics. He's learning a lot. He's from the Midwest. And I had written once, um, you know, uh, I think it was around my birthday. I said, I don't want anyone to give me any gifts, but I'd love for you to donate to my organization. And I put my organization's website. This like random guy in like, I don't know, in some part of Illinois somewhere, like not even from Chicago, donated 50 bucks to my organization on Twitter. And it's a guy wow. that I just had a random conversation. I don't know who he is. I never met him before. And I think people want that. Just, people just want to have a discussion. There's people that never spoke to Muslims before. There's one guy, yeah. this, you know, this one guy once on Twitter was like, I was like, do you have any Muslim friends? And he was like, no, actually I don't. And I was like, maybe that's the problem. I was like, I was like, can yeah. I be your friend? And he was like, uh, yeah, why not? You know, like this idea that people don't have human connections to Muslims yeah. and all they yeah. base their stuff on is what they read or, yeah. you know, well, definitely, you know, if you don't know a Muslim and all you hear is, or, you know, all you saw was mm -hmm. savages versus civilized man. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, um, listen, this was a great discussion and I'm really Thank glad you. Um, we had a chance to do it and that you were able to fit me in between Pam and, Pamela Geller and whatever else you're doing this afternoon. And finally figured out how to work this thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, Linda. Thank you so much. Bye.